I'm going to start with the Sombrero Galaxy. It is taken by the Hoddle Telescope and is the most viewed photo of the collection on the internet. Now that is millions of light years away. It is millions of light years across. And there are millions of suns. Here we are. One planet, one sun, a finite biosphere. Make no mistake, it is finite. We have limitations. To have a functioning society, you require resources. You require energy. You require metals for fabrication, passing of electricity and an alternate to a currency. You require food, grain, rice, stimulants, sweeteners, fabric, sugar, coffee, cotton, chocolate. We'll take it for granted because you can go down the supermarket and buy it. However, demand is increasing, consumption is increasing. One of the reasons is population growth. Urbanisation, I'm just going to touch on each of them briefly. Energy consumption, grain consumption, water consumption, finally desertification. This was a graph that was put together back in um, 1988 and they expected the urban population to increase beyond the agrarian societies, the small um, We've relied so much in history on more people in the country than we have in the cities. They estimate that we're going to have another 2 billion people on the planet within 14 years. Now the problem with these estimations is that we are growing far quicker than a lot of the economists, a lot of the politicians really give credit for. And as this mass urbanisation continues, it is impacting on the fringes. What you've got here is the estimate of rural versus urban. It actually crossed in 2005. They're eight years out. They're eight years out. And now what we've got is we've got more people living in the cities than we do in the country, supporting us with food. Any idea what this is? There you go, well done. It's a crankcase for a ship. From four cylinders to 16. Here it is there. One a week. 1,800 litres. 34,000 gallons a day. Every 24 hours. Every five days one of them's coming out of the factory going into a ship. The Chinese will sell more cars this year than America. I went to a uh, presentation in Shanghai about 12 months ago. I listened to a professor there. He said approximately 250 have similar earning capacity to the West. There's 300 have the earning capacities of Southeast Asia and then the balance over 700 million are not much further than Africa. We cannot afford for China to consume like the West. We do not have the resources. And yet everyone in this room is aware that Chinese are coming down buying Australian goods. They're doing it everywhere around the world. Long Beach, California, 1942, that's when Americans could make cars. This was the oil field that supplied the military forces in the Battle of the Pacific. That's Long Beach now. It's run out. It's run out. Make no mistake, we do not produce crude oil, we extract it. It's a finite resource that we extract. Now, this is the first point and only point from a commercial perspective as a commodity trader I want you to think about. This is effectively what one barrel of crude oil would buy in corn. So if you're an exporting nation, the Middle East, Venezuela, whatever, you're going to be getting around about 10 bushels of corn for your barrel of crude oil. But look what's happened. You can buy more corn now for your oil. But there's a distinct trend starting to develop here. And there's a reason for that. Firstly is the input of hydrocarbons into producing your food that you take for granted has increased over 400% in my lifetime. No energy, no food. It is a, the fertiliser cracked out of natural gas and hydrocarbon products has helped us stay in front. But what you have now is an interesting phenomenon. 
If you're an exporting nation and you're exporting a finite resource and you're buying a renewable resource, at what point is the world going to have a paradigm shift? And what do you think the paradigm shift is? Value what's left. Start valuing what's left and not the utility value. Then we will appreciate it. Crude oil should be $300 a barrel. You should be paying three, four dollars a litre like the English or more. We should not be driving land yachts and we should not be driving V8s. It's madness. What you've got here is harvested acreage in the US. Now it peaked in 1981. Here is production per acre. This is part of the Green Revolution after the Second World War. Industrialisation of farming, use of fertiliser. And what's interesting is when the genetic crops started to come in, we actually saw land drop through urbanisation and desertification, and yet our yields continued. Over 450% per acre, highly dependent on oil. Now isn't that a refreshing chart? Grain production, that's cool, yeah, fine, we can keep on feeding the people. But this is scary. This is very scary, and this is where we are now today. What I've shown is from 1960, a couple of points. It's days left. It's the surplus inventory that we have. The surplus inventory is now back down to around the 60s. However, this graph here is the consumption. And the daily consumption has doubled. Has doubled. So, we're back to the lowest supplies and your consumption has doubled. Now this is an interesting one. This was a, a collection of photos taken by a young German. He went around the world and he photographed what an average family would consume in a week and how much it cost. And note in the West, in Germany, 500 a week, the packaging, liquid, meat, fruits. This is China. This is China. And then there's Chad. Now, that's surrounded by a desert, it's surrounded by conflict that cannot produce the food. But what we have to understand is that we're relying on packaging, we're relying on mechanisation, we're relying on science and engineers to come up with answers. We need water for our crops. There is a big issue in Australia over water, but we're not the only one. If there was ever a civil war in America, and they've already had one, so there's always a possibility of two, is going to be over water, and it'll be in Southern California, Arizona, or Nevada. Fastest growing region with the least amount of water. They've got to do something about it. Hoover Dam, 500 feet below its peak. Interesting too is that it takes 100 tonne of water for one tonne of grain. It takes about 1,000 tonne of water for one Ton, or maybe 100,000 tonne of water for one tonne of cattle. But what's happening is that water is being directed because of the urban growth, is being directed into industries and cities, and marginal land is being left and becoming desert. And the nations that are doing this are importing the water via food. So you imagine there's only so much surplus food around, we call it the global float. And that global float has been diminishing. And the other thing to think about, you may be aware the Chinese recently did a deal with Russia where they, they bought 10 years of supply of oil from a particular region, paying $45 to $50 a barrel over the next 10 years. It's currently at $80 a barrel now. But what they're doing is they're redirecting the water. The Colorado and the Murray, it doesn't make it to the, to the oceans anymore because it's taken out industry, farm and urbanisation. I was originally from Broken Hill, born in the outback, used to dust storms, weren't as bad, but BHP basically deforest as much as they could to feed the furnaces. Once it became prohibitive, they started shipping in coal. But at a 200 mile radius around Broken Hill, there was just nothing. And so we were susceptible growing up to dust storms. This was taken by a, the local photographer, an old mate of mine, of the dust storm that recently hit Sydney. Now when that happened, 72,500 tonnes an hour was topsoil was heading into the Pacific. 
Now, if we have these continually, we're going to have the same problems with desertification just in a higher scale because the more you see these sort of dust being lifted in the ocean, there's less for the seeds and that to grow in. What you see here in red is the desertification process. That's the cancer we face. It is growing. Make no mistake, we are seeing less and less arable land and we are going to be all dependent upon, again, mechanisation and science. Now, whether you believe in global warming or not, jury may be out. But what is happening is that the storms are becoming more severe. I've been in Hong Kong and experienced the highest wind speeds ever recorded in Hong Kong. In Adelaide, if we have 35 degrees today, it'll be the longest heat wave this time of year. I've been in London where they've had the most snow. I, in my short time travelling, I have seen precedence in weather patterns. And what these weather patterns do is they impact on infrastructure and depending on which infrastructure is in the way, whether it's farming or whether it's extracting oil, if there's any engineers in the room, they'd be very discomforted to see that photograph because that's an oil rig that was blown over 100 kilometres onto the Louisiana coast and it wasn't meant to sail 100 kilometres and hit the Louisiana coast. If it was somewhere else within the thousands of oil fields that make up the Gulf, and went down like a ping pong ball, bing, 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 taking out others, and then they started to multiply, we got a serious problem. Luckily, it just knocked out one, but it wasn't meant to happen. So what's coming up? What we're going to see is an inflationary impact starting to hit as a function of increasing food costs. And the weather is going to be the major factor that we've all got to start to watch. And we know that there's more and more um, focus on reducing carbons and it all makes a lot of sense. There's going to, we've already got conflicts over water and energy and, we, and you don't need me to elaborate on it. But there are major rivers in the world that are now being planned to be dammed. One of them's the Mekong. Chinese are planning to dam the Mekong, Vietnamese and the uh, Thais are not happy with that. And so there's going to be issues and where's that water going to be redirected? And finally, we've seen what weather patterns can do along the coastal fringes. But if it hits a major growing area, we do have to change how we value food, how we consume food. For those of you sceptics out there, who are the matadors of logic and rationale and we will find an answer, be very, very careful. This is a global issue. It is a global responsibility and that we will be united, as some of the old books say, with a common threat. Well, that's <coughs> nature. Nature is our common threat. We have treated her with disdain. We have expected unlimited resources and we're now starting to come to peak. And I'm just going to leave you with this because even though you get to the peak, Wherever you look out around you, there's still going to be those consuming. There's still going to be those assuming that we can turn up at triple seven or we can turn up at Woolworths and be able to get our food. I've been in Hong Kong and I've seen a fellow in a black outfit stand with a shotgun to make sure only one person at a time takes out a bag of rice. And so what are we going to do about it? These are, I think, the scenarios that are happening now but how do we address it? This is the issue that we all face and it's something that some answers are being uh, put forward with greening cities, cutting back carbon, managing water better. They may or may not be right, but I think if we're all aware that we are on a fine balance now relative to grains and if the prices go up it's inflationary, the governments cannot in their armory handle a food related or energy related inflationary spiral, which then creates hoarding and then all things start to come unstuck. So I appreciate your time, I'm gonna open it up to discussion because really, I didn't come up with the answers, I just wanted to give you the heads up of what's now evolving. And it's the younger ones, that it's, you know, my children and grandchildren 
and even 10, 15 years younger than me, that do have some serious issues. Going into each of the major cities I do over the last 30 years, one thing is very obvious, they've become compressed. They've become compressed, there's more cars, there's more people. They're centralised and they're drawing down on limited water. How are we going to get it? They're looking at desal plants in, in, uh, in Adelaide, two of them. Not run on solar, which would make sense, seeing we're one of the sunniest countries on earth. Or not run in a pipeline from the top end. As you come down through the centre, use solar to crack it and then drop the salt somewhere in the desert and think what we can do with it later. But no, we're going to use natural gas, finite resource, and then we're going to pump the desal back into the water. May or may not create dead zones. Historically, it, it, fish don't like living in a lot of salinated water. And again, there are issues that can be fixed, but there isn't the drive yet. But what will drive you all is when you're paying four or five dollars a litre, and you're paying 10, 15 dollars for bread. And if you look back through history, and you look at and it's a boring subject maybe, but if you look at the financial world and you think about the lira or the yen, you know, you're buying 100 million lira and you're getting a can of coke. Why? Well, it's inflation and how it works and it's driven by food and energy. So anyway, thank you very much for your time and I'll open it up for any questions.